So good evening and welcome to our first evening in the Leaving Canada speaker series hosted by the Centre for Transnational Mennonite Studies at the University of Winnipeg and Mennonite Heritage Village with support from the Plett Foundation. Before we begin the program tonight, I want to acknowledge that MHV and CTMS are located on Treaty 1 territory, the ancestral and traditional territories of the Anishinaabe, Anishinu, Assiniboine, Cree, Dakota, Dene, and the heartland of the Métis Nation. My name is Andrea Clausen, and I'm the senior curator at Mennonite Heritage Village, a history museum located in Steinbach, Manitoba, that seeks to preserve and exhibit the history of Russian descendant Mennonites in Canada. This year, MHV has partnered with the Plett Foundation and the Mennonite Historical Society of Canada to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the migration of Mennonites from Canada to Mexico with an exhibit aptly named Leaving Canada, the Mennonite Migration to Mexico. And you see some of that behind me in the screen there. The exhibit explores the reasons traditionalist Mennonites left Canada, what they encountered when they arrived and built new settlements in Mexico, and what this migration means for us today. The speaker series will follow these themes, but it also gives us a chance to dig a little deeper into the, some of the topics we weren't able to address in detail in the exhibit. So I'm looking forward to hearing from each of the presentations we have planned throughout the summer and fall. Stick around for the end of tonight's presentation when I'll give you the details of the next event planned for the series. Tonight's speaker is Dr. Aileen Friesen and her talk is entitled Pulling Up Roots in Canada. But before we begin, I have a few housekeeping notes. Um, Aileen's presentation will be followed by a question and answer session. So if you have questions for her, be sure to write those in the Q&A tab and the bottom of your screen. This event is also being recorded and we will post the videos on the CTMS and MHV websites and YouTube channels. So you can catch that if you missed it the first time around or pass it along to a friend. And now without further delay, let's get to tonight's presentation. I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Aileen Friesen, who is an associate professor and a co-director of the Center for Transnational Mennonite Studies at the University of Winnipeg, as well as the executive director of the D.F. Platt Historical Research Foundation. She is the author of Colonizing Russia's Promised Land, Orthodoxy and Community in, on the Siberian Steppe, and the editor of The Russian Mennonite Story, The Heritage Cruise. Aileen also edits the historical magazine, which many of us are probably familiar with, Preservings. And if you aren't a Preserving subscriber, you can sign up on the Plett Foundation's website. I know this coming issue is dedicated to the topic of the migration to Mexico, so you probably won't want to miss that. Aileen, we're looking forward to hearing from you, so I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Andrea, for that introduction. And now I'm just going to share my screen, and hopefully that works. There we go. Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm excited for today's uh, talk. This is a topic that I have a personal connection to. It's actually, the, there are two centenaries that are taking place in 2022 and 2023. 2022 is the migration to Mexico and my great grandfather and, and family were on that migration. And then in 2023 is the celebration of the centenary of the Ruslander coming to Canada. And uh, my maternal side was on that migration as well. So my maternal side took over land that my paternal side left, although my paternal side came back and uh, re-entered Manitoba after a few years in Mexico. So pulling up roots in Canada. Um, this migration, I think, is particularly an interesting one for us to think about because it is the largest voluntary migration out of Canada since Confederation. Approximately 8,000 Mennonites decided that they could no longer have a future in Canada, and they picked up and moved. And even though this migration has historical significance, not only to Mennonites, to Mennonite communities, which were transformed by this migration, but also to Canadian history, it's very interesting that it hasn't received much attention. It's Mennonites have written about it, Mennonite historians have written about it, but the community in general in Canada doesn't think too much about this migration, and it hasn't really resonated with them or with non-Mennonite Canadians. And it's interesting to think about why this might be. Um, for Mennonites, perhaps it's because the ones who remain remember things differently. So 
uh, because the Mennonites here are typically either from the 1870s who then did not travel to Mexico or from the 1920s or from the 1940s migration, uh, they tend to not remember this the issues surrounding the 20s migration to Mexico in the same way that the people who participated on that migration might remember it. Um, for non-Mennonite Canadians, one could um, put forward that perhaps it challenges some of the ideas about Mennonite as a multicultural nation. This was a uh, conflict that took place between Mennonites and the provincial governments of Manitoba and Saskatchewan. Uh, and there wasn't a lot of support um, in some circles, in some governmental circles. In society, there was, there was some split about how people felt about this migration, but among governments, uh, there was, you know, a, a hesitancy to support Mennonites on this issue and in a sense that maybe they weren't necessarily a good fit anymore for uh, Canada. And so people haven't necessarily dug into this, this, this migration as much as they, they should have. And it's good that now that we're at um, the centenary, 100 years ago, this took place, to start to think through some of these issues. And it's a migration that had significant repercussions for Mennonite communities. Uh, first of all, it had repercussions for communities here in that it transformed the landscape. When you have so many people leave, you have land being transferred, land being sold, you have the reorientation of communities, you have the out-migration of certain ideas about Mennonitism and what that means and what that should be. Uh, you also have the, the repercussion of the spread of Mennonites in Latin America. And that this is now a huge group of people that um, really represent this sort of ethno-confessional version of Mennonitism and the traditional lifestyle of Mennonites uh, that is not necessarily the same uh, in Canada, uh, doesn't necessarily remain the same in Canada. So we have this, this um, I don't wanna say it's preservation of a life because they're always transforming as well, but you have this, this different version of Mennonitism than, than we have uh, in Canada. And we also have the formation of these transnational ties between Canada and Latin America. Uh, which my colleague, uh, Dr. Ben nobbs who is a co-director of the center, has done uh, tons of research on and, and will continue to explore those types of issues, those connections between the two places. Uh, and I think this migration is also significant in that it helps us to think through some of these issues of, um, for instance, the role of religion in schools. It helps us to think through issues of language and identity and the relationship between them. And it help, also helps us to sit, think through internal and external debates over assimilation of minority groups, especially their children. And so as you hopefully you'll see the, during this presentation, there were debates among Mennonites about what to do, what is uh, a line that needs to be drawn or what compromises can be made. And there were also debates in the broader society about what should be expected of Mennonites and, and what uh, action should be taken. Uh, to, uh, to bring them into the Canadian fabric, uh, the fabric of Canadian society. So those are some of the themes that we'll be exploring tonight. I decided to start this presentation back in uh, Tsarist Russia. And I think it's an interesting place to start because a lot of us don't necessarily, uh, or at least some of us, I'm sure there's, there's plenty of uh, historians out there watching tonight, but some of us don't necessarily understand the roots of what has become known as the old colony community. And so uh, there's been lots of research done on, for instance, the Kleine Gemeinde as one of the groups that come to Canada during the 1870s, and also uh, research done on the Berchtallers, but who are these old colony who will lead the way uh, to Mexico during the 1920s? And so I want to go back to this 1870 uh, migration from Tsarist Russia to Canada. And of course, that migration was caused by upheaval um, from reforms that were taking place within uh, the Russian state. So reforms um, that the Tsar was looking to um, reformulate Russian society and was trying to make changes. Some of them were administrative changes. Some of them were changes to school and the language that uh, children would be taught in. And the most important one was for, for Mennonites was the issue of conscription and whether or not Mennonites uh, should, be, should be involved in the military. 
So Mennonites had military exemption when they entered the Russian Empire, but by uh, the 1870s, that exemption was um, under reconsideration by the Tsarist state. And we will have uh, lots of debates within Mennonite uh, groups, within the Molochna colony, within the Kortitsa colony, within um, the other offspring colonies that, that had, that had um, been settled um, from the time in which Mennonites entered Tsarist Russia uh, and in that intervening period. But I wanna focus on sort of one group that was in the first inland settlement, which was an offspring of the Kortitsa colony. And this was a, a settlement that was settled only in the 1860s. So relatively shortly before the migration in the 1870s started to Canada. And in um, Furstenland, we had an Altester named Johann Wieb, and he will become one of the leaders of the old colony or the Rhinelander church, as they will become known uh, in Manitoba. And so we have this first inland colony that is sort of related to the Kortitsa colony that will also partially migrate during this 1870s movement. Now it's interesting to note that in um, the original trip that delegates took to Canada to, to investigate the land and to decide whether or not Mennonites from Russia should migrate to North America, uh, the old, uh, there wasn't representation from Kortitsa or from First Inland on that delegation. So there were represent representatives from the Kleine Gemeinde and the Berchtal colony who will then, um, and other places as well, but I'm talking about who will eventually decide to settle in Manitoba. Uh, so they will be the ones who then um, enter into dialogue with the government over the privilegium and will uh, come out with this document that included rights to religious freedom, uh, rights to military exemption, and rights to educate their own children. And so this privilegium will then set the stage for Mennonite migration. This new Canadian privilegium will set the stage for Mennonite migration to Canada. And you can see we have a, a copy of it from Mennonite Heritage Archives uh, on the screen. And so this will become the document that will help um, lead some, at least some Mennonites uh, to, to Canada. Now, of course, this had to be a decision uh, that needed to be made. In some cases, for instance, the Kleine Gemeinde, the Berchtel colony, there was this mass migration where people just all together packed up and left. But in the case of the of Kortitsa and First Inland, there had to be a decision that people had to undertake in order to uh, join in on this migration. And interestingly enough, there was a meeting in Kortitsa between Gerhard Dick, who was the eldest of Kortitsa, and Johann Wieb to discuss whether or not uh, they should lead their groups to migrate uh, to Canada. And Dick was a little hesitant on the idea of migration and, and felt that forestry service was acceptable that the idea that Mennonites, the, the option given to them by the Tsar state, that they could, um, instead of being involved in the military, they could uh, serve in these forestry units and, and plant trees and, and that that was fine. Uh, he decided that that was an acceptable um, path for, for his congregation to take. Johann Wieb decided otherwise. And he didn't, see, didn't agree on, on this, this point uh, with Dick. And he decided that he would lead some people to Canada. And so some families left from First Inland Settlement and then some families from Kortitsa Colony also left. And this divided families. Uh, this is a, a common story among all migrations is that it tends there'll be some people who remain behind and some people who leave. And in this case, uh, this divided Weeb's family, for instance, one of his brothers decided to remain behind and he left with his family. So it's interesting to think about this initial migration as almost this reset button for Mennonites. And Johann Weeb talks about this in his recollection of the migration he talks about how uh, he felt that church discipline was no longer 
was no longer a, a part of Mennonite life in Russia and that this was a problem and that this is something that needed to be corrected. He also spoke about how the treatment of each other uh, within the Mennonite community was problematic. He, he wrote, we have not treated each other with love. And he felt that this was another issue that needed to be addressed during this migration. He also felt that Mennonites had become too worldly, too concerned with conformity, uh, and that there had been too many reforms um, undertaken in Russia, and that this settlement in Manitoba offered a chance to pull back on some of these issues. So for instance, they had introduced a choral book into their, their services. And once they arrived in Manitoba, he decided that perhaps that wasn't the best path forward for, for this community. And he wanted to return to tr tr traditional uh, singing. Uh, if you read his writings, there's also an emphasis on this idea of suffering. So the idea of sort of like the original Anabaptists of, of being present in your faith and of uh, living out your faith and about accepting the consequences that come from living out your faith. And so there was this almost welcoming of this chance to persevere and to experience something different and to also have to rely upon each other uh, during this move. So having to rely on community and, and having to um, rebuild together. So that's an interesting um, that's an interesting theme that we see developing out of this initial 1870s migration to Manitoba. That will have um, repercussions further on into the story. And so, of course, Mennonites arrive in Manitoba. They arrive. They will settle initially in the East Reserve and then also in the West Reserve. This group from Furstenland and Cortiza will settle in the West Reserve. Uh, and uh, I have some photographs here just to acknowledge, uh, first of all, the importance of the Métis in the initial arrival of the Mennonites and in helping Mennonites. Um, so we have the Red River carts that have been commemorated um, recently and also um, the Cairn that has been also been recently put up um, commemorating the Shantz immigration sh sheds uh, and also acknowledging that, of course, um, you know, Mennonites come to this land and there is, is these difficulties with uh, starting out their new lives. Uh, they have to, they have all sorts of struggles with the land, uh, struggles to survive. Uh, they end up in this open place where they have to adapt quite quickly. Uh, so we can have these, still these pioneering stories, but also acknowledge that they had a lot of help along the way. So of course, the government gave them land, the government also gave them loans. There was a uh, process in place in which Mennonites were brought in, which also ended up displacing uh, Métis and Indigenous people. Uh, so these stories can exist together of, first of all, the, the difficulties that Mennonites encountered, but also um, the consequences of their arrival for other people who were living on the land. So Mennonites will get to work quite quickly to establish the roots that they will then pull up once again when they decide to move to, um, to Mexico. And so what was life like in, in the West Reserve? Well, first of all, we have uh, a, a community that has to, to build itself. So we have uh, two thirds are coming from Portiza in terms of this migration that is outside of the Berkdaler and kind of Gemeinde migrations. We have two thirds of them call, coming from Portiza. We have one third from Furstenland. They have to uh, settle their lands. Of course, they're given uh, surveyed lands and loans in contrast to other groups. Uh, they have difficult agricultural beginnings, so they have to construct their villages, but they encounter sickness. And, uh, but they end up reconstructing villages similar in nature to the ones that they had left behind in Russia and communities um, similar but different from the ones they had left behind in Russia. So for instance, right away, they start to establish churches, of course, and there has to be elections for religious leadership and they have to, under, to, have to undertake to put together some sort of cohesion uh, in this new group that is being created and formed. Uh, they will also set up their villages. Uh, they will also set up uh, different institutions to help the Eisenamt, et cetera, to help establish life in Manitoba and to help the community adapt. 
And so out of this group that, that arrives, this uh, Gortica first in line group that ar arrives, arrives, we get uh, the formation of what will be known as the Rhinelander Mennonite Church. And so Johan, we will take leadership of this church and will, uh, as I said before, consciously decide to pull back in certain areas to, um, to reset life. Uh, to think through what had happened in, in, in Tsarist Russia uh, and what might they want to correct uh, here in, in Canada. And so we have that, that process taking place um, in which there is this, this understanding that they will rebuild a life. And he says here that he's not burdened by the question of whether it was right for us to move here um, because they were given freedom of conscience. But God alone knows for how long, um, as far as temporal things are concerned, it seems good here. So this was in a letter that he wrote back to his brother in Tsarist Russia. And that is a picture of the church. Uh, it's a, by the time this photograph was taken, it was no longer a church uh, because the community had already left, but that is the, the original Rhinelander church. I'll just mention that we have, of course, uh, I'm going to talk mostly about the Rhinelander and the old or the old colony uh, in today's lecture, but there will be other groups that are uh, a part of this story and who will also, parts of them will migrate down to Mexico. So the Zummerfelder will be one of these groups, and this is a photograph of the Zummerfelder community, but I won't focus on them today. So schools, I mentioned that they right away create their own schools. Uh, and of course, this is important that they understood that children should be educated. Uh, they wanted to educate their children within their own schools, using their own teachers. And this was such an important issue that they even asked about it from the outset of their settlement in Canada. And of course, education was a different, uh, there is a, a different approach to education on the part of the old colony. Um, although this is reflected among other Mennonite groups as well, the idea that education uh, is meant for to bring children into the church and into the community, that education is not there so that individuals can achieve uh, all of the, their potential or that individuals can then use their skills to aspire to something greater uh, or to make a lot of money, right? That doesn't go along with ideas of humility uh, that were important to these initial settlers. And so children were taught the basics to read, to write, to do arithmetic, and they were taught all of these um, skills in German. So this was not viewed as a, as a door into a broader world, but rather a door into the community, into becoming a member of that community. Mennonites will come, they will establish their schools, uh, and they will, over time, of course, come into conflict with governments over what is the meaning of schools. This was already starting to develop in the Russian Empire um, previously. Of what is the, the purpose of schools, of what the state needs schools for. And so it isn't surprising that this will also arise as an issue uh, in Canada and in Manitoba and Saskatchewan. So education, the idea of being education, being necessary to teach future citizens and to uh, assimilate different groups of people into a political space. Uh, this in Manitoba, uh, the influx of settlers from all sorts of different places, all sorts of different languages, uh, put this on the agenda of the government of how do we create cohesion within this space. And so, uh, they will move, the government will move towards greater involvement in schools in general, not specifically towards Mennonites, but just in general. So in, the eight, in 1890, there'll be the Manitoba School Act, which will put English into public schools and will also establish more oversight. There's pushback against this uh, type of intervention into schools, and there'll be a compromise that will come into place which will allow minority groups under certain conditions to then um, have instruction in their own language, because obviously it's not just Mennonites, but there are French Canadians, there are Poles, there are Ukrainians, there's all sorts of other groups that are here 
in Manitoba. But it's the, the start of a process by which the government will, uh, will um, insert itself more forcefully into the issue of education and into thinking through its own role in education. Uh, it's not only just about standards of education, it's also about the types of people that they wanted to create. So they wanted to uh, instill a sense of patriotism into students and they will pass a flag legislation so that all public schools should fly the Union Jack. Uh, this was becomes an issue for Mennonites because some groups had decided that the public school system wasn't necessarily a bad thing, but they didn't like this intervention of militarism into their schools and into their school system. Um, for others, it was one more sign that of things to come that the, the government was starting to legislate in this area and that they needed to be cautious and to uh, pay attention to what was happening and going on. We focus a lot up on the issue of school uh, for this 1920, 1920s migration to Mexico. But of course, this isn't just the only issue that is at stake for this community. And we have to be a little bit cautious. So I have a quote here from Isaac Dick, uh, who will become a minister in the old colony church. He will also be one of uh, primary figures in the migration to Mexico and will become a leader in Mexico. And he will write a memoir while he's in Mexico describing this period. And this is actually the memoir that we will be publishing for Preservings in our upcoming issue, a translation of this memoir. And so we have to be cautious that he might be reflecting back and projecting back ideas. Um, but I think he does raise some points that we had already seen earlier among Johann Wiebe and that we can see this, this pattern of, of thinking among the old colony that sort of reflects their worldview. And so in this quote, he, he's talking about not just schools as being an issue for what was taking place in Manitoba, what was making people rethink whether or not that they should uh, pull up the roots from Manitoba. Uh, it's not just schools, it is also worldliness that had come into communities, into rural Mennonite communities in Manitoba. And so he points to brightly painted houses. He points to these buggies with their fine upholstery, uh, their ornamented harnesses, uh, the automobiles that were coming into mother Manitoba, and also trade because Mennonites, uh, as they had you know, farmed the land, started to become quite successful from their initial entry where they had to begin again gave up all everything in Russia, had to begin again, uh, they had progressed quite significantly. And this issue arose about what, what's the, how much money is enough? Uh, what can you do with that money? And, and then once you get into trade, you have to learn a language, the language of the land. Uh, and so all of these issues began to kind of come coalesce together and got people, leaders like Isaac Dick to think through, okay, what is, what is really happening? What should we be focused on as a community? And this is, I love this photograph. You'll see, also see it in Preservings. It's Gretna playing pool in the 1920s. Uh, so of course the expansion of pool halls was an issue and, and Mennonite participation in them. Here are Mennonites in, with motorcycles uh, also in the Gretna area. So this, this exposure of Mennonites to the outside world uh, and the fear how this might affect children, uh, how children might be influenced by these trends taking place within communities. So these trends that were then also being reflected within the school system. And of course, he the fear of, of, of worldliness and the fear of more government intervention in school went back to the same question of the community and the ability of the community to separate itself from the world and whether or not they could sort of re keep that line uh, as the world around them was developing. And so this is a, I, I found this picture in the archives of Manitoba and it is Mennonite Collegiate Institute in Gretna. So a Mennonite institution uh, education institution that is being built, and you can see all the cars lined up uh, in front of this Mennonite Institute uh, of Education. And so these are some of the, the, the 
the images that were concerning to portions of the Mennonite community. Of course, not all, all of the Mennonite community were, um, were concerned about this, but at least the, the old colony um, had some reservations about where life in Manitoba was going. So these reservations existed before World War II happened. I mean, World War I, sorry, before World War I happened, uh, but then they were exacerbated by them. So Mennonites, of course, had military exemption, but this was a strong, a period of strong resentment towards Mennonites, um, particularly since they had this military exemption and other Canadians uh, looked at them and wondered why they got such special treatment. And there were questions about them benefiting economically from this and what were they giving to the state, which was, in a, which was at war. And so there are all these questions floating around uh, as the war started and, and Mennonites had to face um, this, this um, inquiry into, their, into who they were and, and what, what their contribution to Manitoba, to Saskatchewan actually was. And I also think that we need to um, understand the war as an accelerant so that even though there were people who supported Mennonites um, before the war started, uh, after or during the war and afterwards, life had changed significantly because of the, the war and the, the destruction and that entire experience. And so I, I wanted to give you this example to illustrate this point. So before the war started, Free Press, so also known as the Winnipeg Free Press now, Manitoba Free Press publicly supported the idea of bilingual schools. They had an editorial, they printed it, they said that this was fine, that we shouldn't, we should allow these bilingual schools to continue on within the province. And they spoke, the editorial spoke specifically about the Mennonite case and it advocated time and patience to solve the problem of Mennonite private schools uh, and claimed that those Mennonites who attended public schools, even though they were in these bilingual schools, which had English, both English and German, that they were doing fine in English and that we should just give this whole situation time and it would eventually resolve itself that the younger generation will, would want to participate within Canadian society and would want to learn English and that the government should just leave it alone. By 1919, the tone of the newspaper had changed significantly. Then it was about citizenship, about the duty of the state to properly educate its citizens. And so this, there was no longer sort of this leeway, this room for adaptation of minority groups. It was this must be done right now. And so we can see this change taking place during the war. And interestingly, during the war, uh, if we look at Isaac Dick's uh, memoir, we can also see this concern of both um, Mennonites fulfilling their role, so acting properly. So on the one hand, they weren't going to war, uh, they weren't joining the military, but that they had all also been influenced by, by a culture and a worldliness that was seeping into their, their hearts. So he, he wrote uh, this wonderful quote, it is sad to look at our people in one pocket, they carry the card signed by the Eltistern, verifying that they were Mennonites and that they were therefore exempt from military service. So this is what all people had to carry or all Mennonite men had to carry to show that they were exempt, that they were part of the Mennonite church and that they were allowed to have that exemption. Uh, and in the other pocket, they carried their bottle of schnapps and went calmly and surely into the drinking establishments and playhouses, indulging in a godless life. So this is Isaac Stick's interpretation of what was going on among Mennonites during this time of war. Uh, it does, doesn't mean that we have to take him exactly at his word. He was uh, a minister after all, and he was making a point. But his point being that, uh, that, that, that life had changed significantly in Manitoba and that it was time to reconsider uh, what was important to Mennonites. And so during this period of the war, there'll be more educational changes coming. Um, the provincial government will become concerned, even though it's wartime and they have many other concerns, they'll become concerned about educational standards. There'll be this uh, almost frantic need 
to make Canadians uh, and to make them in this British model. And so that meant speaking English. Uh, they had this fear that there was too much diversity in, in the province and that this diversity was going to breed uh, disunity. And so therefore they had to clamp down on all of this difference and particularly different languages that were being spoken. And so we will see during this period, during World War I, they will abolish the bilingual school system. Uh, this will initiate or uh, deepen an already festering wound between Mennonites and the government in which Mennonites, some Mennonites will then switch quickly to private schools. Um, so they had gone sort of into the public system um, because there was money there and there was some opportunity there and they will try to switch quickly back into private schools. And there will also be compulsory school attendance for ages seven to 13. And this will uh, further um, concern Mennonites. And also there is this sort of back and forth on, on military service. So on the one hand, Mennonites had exemption from military service. The government tried to reassure them that this was protected. But on the other hand, all these changes were taking place within the school system. And Mennonites had felt like those were protected by the government and yet now they weren't. And so there were these, this growing concern among Mennonites about what they could trust and what they couldn't trust. And when the government gives its word, is it actually its word or is, it, or is this somehow misleading Mennonites? So the government, uh, so the Manitoba government I'm talking about this specifically, but also the Saskatchewan government will praise Mennonites who comply with this new system. They will say that this is the way in which Mennonites are being initiated into progressive society. They will build new public schools in Mennonite communities. Uh, Mennonites will call these schools forced schools. So they will, these schools will have to be funded by taxes from the communities, but the government will just go in and put them there and try to force Mennonite children into these schools. Uh, they will also name some of these schools after World War I battles and other um, sort of English titles in order to, um, I guess, assimilate Mennonites. But of course, Mennonites saw this as, as militarism being introduced into their communities. So here's one example of such a school, the Passchendaele School, um, of course, named after the battle. And so uh, this is one of the concerns that Mennonites had. They will also, the government will also place similar standards on the private schools which had been operating. Uh, they will want to send teachers to them, teachers who have been educated with it up to the government standards, uh, who are outside of the community and are not linked into the community. Uh, they will revert some of the public schools back to private schools, and they will prosecute Mennonites who don't comply. Now, they don't just prosecute Mennonites. This is important to understand that this was not a policy directed towards Mennonites all bilingual schools, um, and, but Mennonites uh, exp deeply experienced this change. And there were many Mennonites who were fined or who ended up going to jail uh, because of not sending their children to school. Uh, they would also have sometimes their food and other farm equipment confiscated. And so this is one of the prisons um, that Mennonites were sent to. On top of this, we have a pandemic that will then happen. And this will only sort of further inflame the situation as Mennonites have to deal with government restrictions related to the pandemic. And we'll also experience the, hard, the, the heartache of the pandemic uh, in terms of deaths within their communities. I'd like to point out that there were both supporters and detractors on both sides. So we can see during this period, editorials appear some non-Mennonites criticize the government for what they see as being a heavy-handed policy uh, towards Mennonites. They emphasize Mennonite contribution to Canada, to agriculture. They emphasize that these are rural people uh, who aren't trying to get into the cities. They actually want to be on the land. Uh, they want to be working the land. And they, they question whether or not the government acted in good faith in their treatment of Mennonites. Um, but others took the opposite stand. Uh, and they said that the government's policies were both legal and were supported on moral grounds. And they blamed um, leadership, religious leadership among Mennonites as being the cause of this. So here's a quote from uh, the Manitoba Free Press, who bl blaming the reactionary clique who thinks the best way of retaining control over the Mennonites is to keep 
the ignorant. And this will all culminate into a desire of the old colony uh, to leave Canada. And they will look for all sorts of different places where they might be able to migrate to, where they might be able to have freedom of religion and the freedom to educate their children as they see fit. And eventually Mexico, they'll find Mexico is the place where they are able to do that. And they will sell their land. Sometimes it was very difficult to do so. And they will pack up um, and load their animals, equipment and families onto trains and leave. And so here's one of the scenes from the Gretna train station leaving uh, Canada. And of course they will leave and then we will have the Ruslander coming into Canada. And there's all sorts of um, fascinating, fascinating themes that can be developed about this, about who is a good Mennonite uh, according to what criteria and what standards. And, uh, and I'll be presenting on that topic at our upcoming Mennonite uh, CTMS conference in the fall that looks at uh, this issue of Mennonite migration to Latin America. So here are a bunch of scenes and also a final scene in, in Mexico. I, just to conclude, I want to sort of just to education um, so we can see that some, the government approach was about assimilating citizens. Uh, the Mennonite approach was contributing, was to create contributing members of a religious community. And that these are different ways to think through the idea of education and, and um, we can sort of understand that education is not, we, many of us and many of us who are educators think that education is wonderful and of course it is, but there are many different ways and approaches that we can understand the purpose of and the intent behind education. Uh, we can also see language as a conscious barrier to integration. So Mennonites did not want to have, the old colony did not want to have English language schools. They felt that was a, a step towards their integration into society and integration into a militaristic society. And they were very adamant that that not take place. And that was a line that they were willing to draw was the issue of language. We also see this issue of moderate versus dramatic change. So education had been an issue for a long time, but it was just in that sort of war period that it intensifies to a, a large extent. And we can think through what might have happened if um, there more time would have been given. And we can also see that the, pulling up roots, um, the process of pulling up roots is both sim simple and, and complicated. Uh, it's a simple process in, in the sense that they simply moved. Uh, they decided, they made a decision, the leadership made a decision and people followed along and went with them. But it's also complicated in terms of, of the whole process by which they got to that moment in time. So I'll end on that note and uh, hopefully you have some questions. Thanks, Aileen. Um, so everybody, this is your time. You have Aileen's attention and uh, hopefully you can uh, write in your questions in the Q&A tab at the bottom. Please don't write them in the chat because it's harder for me to find them there. <laughs> um, so we'll just, uh, you know, open it up for questions, but maybe to, to lead off Aileen, I have a, a question of my own. Um, you, you touched on this in a few different places in your talk, but uh, you know the public school legislation in, in Manitoba and Saskatchewan didn't just affect Mennonites. It wasn't directed at Mennonites. Can you talk about um, the Mennonite reaction compared to other uh, you know, immigrant communities or maybe the, the French Catholic minority in Manitoba specifically? Were Mennonites unique in any way in, in how this, this legislation uh, affected them or, or in their response to it? Yeah, it's an interesting question. And it, it, I think that it also highlights the attention that needs to be given to this topic. Like, even though there's been some scholarship on it, it's surprising about how little there's been since this is about an issue and a topic that affected so many different groups. And how can we think about their response and their reaction? Uh, what can design the individual groups. And so there is like, uh, like I said, Ukrainians, Poles, other groups, French were all affected by, by this policy. And, and some groups did, reacted similarly in, in, as Mennonites in that they just kept on doing it, right? Like it's sort of like catch us, 
<laughs> catch us if you can. Um, <laughs> and then they'd lie to inspectors. Um, I'm not sure if there's, you know, uh, or they would, yeah, they, and they wouldn't participate in, in certain types of schools. Uh, so there are similarities in, in that response of just, um, you know, we're going to keep on doing this until you can actually clamp down on us. But in, but in terms of a good comparison, that would be a wonderful project, right? Don't you think for someone to do because it hasn't been done yet, but yet this was a, a policy that there's been sort of this focus. Mennonites have done probably the most work on it, uh, focusing on their response and reaction, but it's always told from their perspective instead of from this like broader um, mm -hmm. understanding of what's happening within the province and both in Saskatchewan and Manitoba, which are just fascinating cases. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting. It seems like every community comes at it from their own particular angle, but nobody really looks at the broad picture of, of what this meant. But uh, we do have a few questions filtering in here. So we have one from uh, Linda Thiessen. Can you elaborate on the experiences of children during this time? It's a great question. Yeah, thank you, Linda. That's a wonderful question. I don't think we have any, I haven't found any sources, but maybe there are people out there who, who have that describe what it's like to, first of all, not be <laughs> allowed to go to a school, right? To be kept back. Uh, sometimes parents hid their children. So to be told uh, when, because they would take um, census, right? To get a, a count of the children in, in an area. And to be told when, when that person came around to like go away by your parents to like hide from, from these people. I mean, that would have been very confusing, I think, for children. Or in some cases, children would end up, or parents would move out of districts to get away from the public schools. So that would also be a confusing experience for children of, of having to go. Or even what they thought when they were asked to do things and whether or not they questioned it. like here's a flag. What should, <laughs> what should I think about this flag? You know, I've been told what to think of perhaps by my parents, but like how much of that information was being communicated to children uh, at the time? And so that was, isn't a great answer to your question, Linda, but it is a fantastic question of what were, what was the responses of children um, to this? So we can get just little kind of snippets of, of, uh, of what their experiences were. We get little snippets of their experience on the migration, but in terms of like an actual analysis of what that was like for them, that's a little bit more difficult. Mm -hmm. um, let's see here. Eugene Jansen writes, uh, were Mennonites the only quote unquote ethnic group to consider the changes problematic and emigrated elsewhere? They're the only group I know of that considered that option. And of course, not all Mennonites consider that option. Now, I might be wrong on this. I'm not wrong about all Mennonites, but I might be wrong about other groups. Uh, but they were uh, the ones, the main ones that they're talking about and that the newspapers are talking about, like uh, almost daring Mennonites to leave. They won't leave. They've got too much land here. They have too much prosperity here. There's no way they're going to leave. And then, uh-oh, I guess they are going. Um, and so a response and reaction to them. So when I was going through the the Manitoba Free Press. Those were the main stories I was finding about about Mennonites. Um, so I think that they were the main group. But it, once again, it goes to this this whole question of response and reaction of, from other groups who also had their own language, their own way of educating their children, their own understanding of education, their own religious structures, and how that would have fed into um, sort of this issue. Mm -hmm. But you did find like looking at the Manitoba Free Press, for example, that they are in the in the kind of public realm, they are also pointing at Mennonites as being a unique problem in that in that kind of way. As yeah, to other groups. I think that they are pointing to Mennonites being a unique, unique problem that they always see Mennonites as being um, would be the, the, I don't want to say unique, they peculiar is, is the term they use about us peculiar we're a peculiar people and we need to be sort of treated a little bit lightly now of course the, the difference between um, our situation and other people's situation is that there was this privilegium and so we claimed a legal right to this education of our own of our children in our own schools mm -hmm. uh, uh, that was stated to not be the case 
because of education being a provincial matter versus a federal matter and the agreement being of the privilegium being made with the federal government. Uh, so obviously there were like legal ramifications and a lot of the times that that legal element and um, interpretation was important to people trying to analyze this issue, uh, mm -hmm. both on the side of the Mennonites and on the side of the government. So that might be one way in which the, the issue is a little bit different for Mennonites than other mm -hmm. groups. Mm -hmm. um, Henry Friesen asks, in what ways was the Saskatchewan government's approach regarding schooling different from that of the Manitoba government? Henry, that's a great question. And uh, I'm not an expert on the Saskatchewan situation um, by any means, but I was, as I was going through, I was thinking, okay, what is, you know, is there an actual difference in policy and approach? And I was looking, okay, well, there's a liberal government here, a liberal government there. Uh, what is the, this, this response? And can we see, you know, particular differences? And there might be in sort of the individual understanding of policies, some like when, treatment, how harsh it was. Uh, it was harsh in both places, but there were a lot of, there was a lot of fines in Saskatchewan. There were fines in Manitoba too. The, you know, like you can go kind of go back and forth uh, with that. But what I was struck by was this opinion by both governments that they were being tolerant. That it wasn't, <laughs> that it wasn't that they were doing something outlandish, that they were doing something that was improper. It was that they had tried uh, and that they were being as tolerant as they could uh, under these circumstances. And I found that opinion shared by both governments to be quite, quite intriguing uh, in the ways in which they saw their own actions during this period. Hmm. Interesting. Well, it's nice to have your cake and eat it too sometimes. <laughs> um, Wayne Garman asks, was it only old colony, uh, old colony Mennonites who left from Mexico? Uh, no, so there'll be all, um, <clears throat> old colony will be one of the main groups. And then there'll also be Zummerfelders who will go and then some, um, this is Saskatchewan case, Andrea, you're gonna have to correct me on this one about the, <laughs> the, the, the birth dollars from Manitoba stayed, but the birth, some of the birth dollars from Saskatchewan left. Um, so, we, we, we wrote a panel about this in the exhibit and we thought, what's a simple way to outline which groups came, like which groups stayed and which groups went? There is no simple way <laughs> of outlining that in a, in a short amount of time. It's, it's a complicated history for sure. Yeah, lots of divisions. We Mennonites like our divisions. Yeah, but there is one person who asks, was the old colony the largest of the groups who left? Yes, the old colony was the largest of the groups who left. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Shirley asks, could this, I guess this whole topic of, of the school maybe, could this be why initially the government banned Mennonites from coming to Canada around 1919, if I'm recalling correctly, since the Mennonites here were already not wanting to attend schools, etc.? So, yeah, it was, it was part of the whole reasoning given in, in the not necessarily the schools, but the idea that Mennonites can't assimilate. Mennonites won't assimilate. Mennonites are a weird group that has their own customs and they aren't changing and they aren't adapting in the ways that we want them to adapt. Even though Mennonites obviously were clearly economically making significant contributions to Canada, um, they weren't contributing in these other ways that the government deemed necessary and essential. And this issue and topic will also come up with the Ruslander migration. So the Ruslander will then be presented as, these are the types of Mennonites you want. These are the right kind of Mennonites for Canada. These are the Mennonites who are willing to uh, be educated in, in these schools. These are the ones that won't cause you any problems. So you should, you should let these ones in. Because in the exact same time in which, if you think in 1918, is when they're sending the study commission from, um, from Russia over right to investigate possibilities for Mennonite migration out of what will become the Soviet Union. And so it's happening at the exact same time that they're discussing this issue that the old colony are figuring out how to leave. And so this comparison between the two groups and what is a good Mennonite, it was bound to take place. 
Uh, one comment here from Bill Jansen about the difference between the two systems in Saskatchewan and Manitoba, he says, is that Saskatchewan never had a bilingual system. So that goes to a, a previous question. And we just have uh, a few more minutes here. Um, well, this question might, might be an interesting one to kind of conclude on, Aileen, because it, it asks for some interpretation and in what this might mean for us today. So uh, Betty writes, you mentioned before coming to North America or Canada, the Mennonite freedoms were being eroded in Russia. Then several decades later in Canada, freedoms began being eroded again, resulting in a mass exodus. Is it possible that trust in government authority to this day has been eroded because of the erosion of the freedom of religion? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, it also gets to this, this issue of how you define freedom uh, and what are the duties and obligations that get you said freedom. And this is a part of the development of the nation state and how people and groups fit into that system. Uh, so in terms of trust, uh, First of all, I want to make this point very clear is that this idea that Mennonites were then sort of had this idea that 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 agreements last forever is really not reality. And you see this in what happened in the, the Russian case is that Mennonites negotiated with the Russian state, found that they couldn't come to an agreement, asked to be allowed to leave, were allowed to leave and left. Right. Uh, so they say they didn't sort of say, how dare you? Catherine the Great promised us this. We you can't take this away from us. Uh, that mentality, this 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 idea that Mennonites put their belief and their faith in governments is just it wasn't part of sort of their conceptualization of the world. And the same thing here. They they tried. They tried to talk to the government. They took it to court. They did all sorts of paths in order to address this issue. And in the end, they couldn't come to um, a place in which they felt comfortable for the future of their children. And they decided to leave. Uh, so can we trust governments? I mean, governments are, are a product of society. Can you trust society? I don't know. Uh, it's the best we can do under these circumstances. And, and Mennonites have traditionally understood that, right? That, that this is all part of, of the world and we do our best with that part of, of, of our existence. So lots of interesting questions um, in, in a topic like this, um, but we have reached the, the hour. Um, so thank you very much, Aileen, for your presentation um, on behalf of MHV and everybody here tonight. Thank you very much. And thanks for everybody who participated with questions. As I mentioned at the outset of the evening, tonight's presentation was the first event in our Leaving Canada speaker series hosted by CTMS and MHV. We have more events like this coming up each month from now until October. So a few things to write in your calendar. Our next event will be on July 26th when I'll be hosting Kevin Dick, curator at Museo Menonita, a Mennonite museum in Cuauhtémoc, Chihuahua, Mexico. His talk is entitled Putting Down Roots in Mexico, and he'll be discussing the history of the Mennonite community in Mexico, particularly in Manitoba Colony over the last century. Registration is now open on the CTMS website for this event, so register and mark your calendars. The speaker series is based on the exhibit Leaving Canada, the Mennonite Migration to Mexico, which is on display at MHV now until November 30th. So we hope to see you at the museum over the summer to take it in. But for those of you who are further afield, MHV does plan to launch an online version of the exhibit in late summer or early fall. So you can stay tuned uh, for an opportunity to take in the exhibit that way as well. Once again, thank you very much, Aileen, for your presentation this evening. And thank you for everyone who watched and, and participated with questions. We look forward to hosting another evening like this on July 26th with Kevin Dick, who will be joining us all the way from Cuauhtémoc with the perspective of the Mennonite community there. Have a great night.